Voilà. So welcome everybody to the Snow Lab seminar series. So today's speaker uh, is Professor Irene Tamborra. She is Associate Professor at the Niels Sports Institute in Copenhagen, the University of Copenhagen. She studied in the University of Bari in Italy, and then she moved to Munich to be the Alexander von Humboldt Fellow at the Max Planck Institute. And then she moved to Amsterdam as a research associate at Grappa, that is the Center of Excellence at the University of Amsterdam. She received a lot of uh, awards for her pioneering award in multi-messenger astrophysics, including the Merak Prize for the best early career research from the European Astronomy Society and the Dagal Award. So Irene uh, research aimed at unveiling the nature of weak interacting elementary particle and explore the role of these particles in astrophysical sources, in the synthesis of new elements and in the early universe. She also adopted neutrinos as probe for the inner uh, of uh, the inner work of astrophysi astrophysical transient together with photon, cosmic ray, and gravitational waves. So I leave you. Irene discuss the messenger of the cosmos. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So hi everyone. And also thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and feel free to interrupt me anytime. So we know that uh, the, the main way that we have to explore uh, anything that is unknown to us uh, is through our senses. And uh, when it cosm comes to cosmic distances and uh, um, we try to go to move beyond uh, what we can actually reach, then uh, the only sense that is left is our sight. And indeed, uh, humankind has uh, used uh, our sight to explore the cosmos since uh, the very beginning. And gradually we have expanded uh, using more wave bands and indeed, in the uh, 90s, Russell and Turner put together what they called the Grand Unified Photon Spectrum, where they collected the, all the information that we have about the cosmos uh, through uh, photons. Today, we have uh, new opportunities to learn about uh, the universe by using uh, two uh, new messengers that are uh, neutrinos and gravitational waves. And in the rest of my talk, I'm going to uh, associate the neutrinos to our touch and the gravitational waves to our hearing. Now, in, uh, in this talk, I will first describe uh, the status of the neutrino astronomy as of today. And then we will see how neutrinos can uh, tell us about the physics of compact astrophysical sources and also cosmic accelerators and that, uh, how they are uh, a window to uh, physics beyond the standard model. So for those of you that are uh, not familiar with the, uh, these particles, neutrinos are the second most abundant particle in our universe after photons. And they uh, exist in three different flavors, Nui, Numiu, and Utau, and their own antiparticles. Um, th those particles are uh, usually also named the ghostly particles because they interact extremely weakly. And this makes them ideal uh, messengers of astrophysical sources, but also uh, their weakly interaction, interacting nature is the reason why they are also so elusive to uh, catch and to detect on Earth. However, when it comes to astrophysics, neutrinos together with the gravitational waves can be considered as ideal probes because they are produced deep in the core of astrophysical sources and they carry intact, because they do not interact, information about the physics that is uh, ongoing in the core of these sources, which wouldn't be otherwise available. Uh, and if we compare them with respect to uh, photons instead, the photons interact way more often. Or for example, cosmic rays and therefore protons, they um, change their trajectory very often uh, as they interact through, uh, as they get bended through magnetic fields. So in this sense, the neutrinos really travel undisturbed. And this is why they carry, uh, they don't lose information on their way. Now, um, we know that the neutrinos can change their flavor while uh, they are propagating. And uh, this is a peculiar property that, of course, it tells us about uh, the, uh, phys the physics of neutrinos as uh, uh, particles. But also, when we consider flavor conversions in astrophysical sources, the uh, flavor conversion physics depends on the uh, matter background that the neutrinos meet on their way. 
And as such, by considering which is the uh, flavor ratio that, for example, we uh, detect, then we can um, also extract information about uh, the source properties. Now, if we consider neutrinos as uh, probes in astrophysics, then uh, we can reconstruct an energy distribution for those particles, as we can also do for photons. We can also then uh, reconstruct uh, the evolution of the uh, neutrino uh, curve as a function of time, as again we do for photons. But in addition, we can also consider the flavor information, which in this case is something peculiar to neutrinos. If you want, we can associate it to um, the polarization of photons. But here, in this case, we have uh, three different variables. Now, the idea of using uh, neutrinos to do astronomy uh, was, has been a dream for a long time. Indeed, in the 30s, Beta and Pierce were saying that unless uh, there are new forces, we can conclude that there is no way to uh, observe the neutrino. And then uh, John Bacall, um, he started to uh, grasp the, the role, the potential role that the neutrinos could have in, our, in astrophysical sources. And indeed, he was uh, claiming that only neutrinos with their extremely small uh, cross-sections can enable us to see into the interior of the stars. However, uh, at the end of the 80s, in the preface of his book, which was titled The Neutrino Astrophysics, he uh, wrote that the, the title is more of an expression of hope than a description of the book contents. So although he was uh, uh, grasping the potential of those particles in uh, carrying information about the physics of astrophysical sources, he was also realizing how challenging this uh, would have been. However, neutrino astronomy is today a reality. And in the following, I'm going to give you three examples of where we stand today. The first example is, uh, concerns our sun. So we are used to look at the sun by uh, naked eyes, but we can also look at the sun through neutrinos. And indeed, the, the image that you see here is an image of the sun taken through neutrinos. This has been uh, reconstructed by the Super Kamiokande experiment by using the uh, scattering, the elastic scattering of neutrinos and electrons in uh, the detector, which preserves the directionality of the incoming events. Now, the detection of uh, uh, neutrinos from the sun has led to the discovery uh, of neutrino flavor conversions. And also, since the neutrino flux is extremely sensitive to the temperature of the sun in the regions where those neutrinos are produced, this has allowed to uh, provide a test for the standard solar model. The second example is the supernova 1987A that was detected in 1987 in the um, Large Magellanic Cloud. And um, we know that the supernovae originate from the uh, death of stars that have at least eight times uh, the mass of the sun. And when a supernova explodes, the 99% of its energy is released under the form of neutrinos. This is exactly the contrary than what happens in the sun, for example, where most of the uh, energy goes into uh, electromagnetic radiation. So we expect a huge number of neutrinos to be emitted from a core collapse supernova, about 10 to the 58 neutrinos. However, in 1987, many detectors were not working. And so we detected only like uh, a few, uh, like 15 to 20 events. However, those were enough to uh, probe the, uh, the stellar collapse and also to put a lot of constraints on physics that is uh, non-standard. And still uh, today, we follow the remnant of uh, this supernova through electromagnetic radiation. The third example is instead uh, concerning the neutrinos with the uh, pevatron energy. Those have been detected for the first time in 2013 by uh, the IceCube uh, telescope. And uh, today, we detect a few hundreds of uh, neutrino events. We know that they have an astrophysical origin. However, it's not yet clear what are the sources of those uh, neutrinos. Now, what is coming next? So what you see here is a, um, a sketch of what we call the grand unified neutrino spectrum in analogy to the grand unified photon spectrum that I uh, showed you before. And you can see uh, a collection of all the sources of neutrinos that we know of today. 
What is amazing in this plot is that the, uh, the neutrino spectrum is spanning about uh, 24 orders of magnitude in energy and more than 48 orders of magnitude in uh, intensity of its flux. And what is uh, less known of this flux at the moment is uh, uh, the low energy tail of the spectrum that concerns the neutrinos uh, coming from the early universe, as well as the high energy tail of the spectrum that instead um, is about the neutrinos of very high energy. And some of them we still have to uh, detect. So in the rest of my talk, I'm going to uh, focus on this uh, uh, right part of the, uh, of the spectrum. And of course, if you have questions, we can discuss also about uh, the rest of the, the, the spectrum. Now, what you see here is uh, um, a sketch that summarizes all the detectors that are currently available that would be sensitive to neutrinos uh, of uh, astrophysical origin. And the ones that you see in parentheses are currently under planning or construction. Now, what is interesting is that uh, it might well be that this map is at the moment uh, not fully up to date because there are continuously new proposals uh, coming up online. But it's very interesting that uh, um, we are in the position of being able to look at one astrophysical event by using different detectors and also different technologies. The technologies that have been mostly used up to now are uh, Cherenkov and liquid uh, scintillator detectors. And uh, for the future, as we will see in the following, there are also alternative technologies that are being uh, proposed. Now, one of the least uh, understood classes of astrophysical sources are uh, compact sources. One of these are uh, core collapse supernovae. So we have seen before that the all dynamics of a supernova is uh, completely driven by a neutrinos, given the large amount of neutrinos that are produced in the stellar collapse. And if we um, expect, if we think of, a, uh, of the next supernova that we would expect to see, then if the supernova is uh, enough close by, then we could see also the pre-supernova neutrinos that would tell us about uh, the collapse that is happening. And then we would see neutrinos together with gravitational waves. And only a few hours up to one day afterwards, we will uh, catch uh, photons. So one of the uh, interesting and still to be tested uh, uh, open issues concerned, uh, concerning supernova physics is uh, concerns the uh, explosion mechanism. Indeed, we think that the, the supernova explodes um, because of what is called the, the delayed explosion uh, mechanism that uh, um, is such that the, the shock wave uh, forms within uh, the iron core, but then it starts because it loses all its energy by dissociating iron nuclei. And uh, neutrinos then provide the new energy to uh, revive the shock wave. And in this uh, process of uh, providing new energy, there are convective motions as well as uh, uh, what is called the, the standing accretion shock instability, that is a bouncing of the shock wave as it acquires energy, that make more efficient this energy transfer to revive than uh, the shock wave. Now, it turns out that if we look at the uh, three-dimensional hydrodynamical simulations, and we look at what we should see for the neutrino signal, we actually can test that this explosion mechanism through uh, neutrinos. What you see here on the top of these slides are some snapshots of a 3D hydrodynamical simulation. There is no need to understand all the details, but those are four different time snapshots as the time is increasing. And this ball that you see at the center is the proton-neutron star. And this is the shock wave, and those are isocontours of entropy. So what you can see is that we start from something that is spherically symmetric, but then as time goes by, some asymmetries start to generate, and you see we have these sloshy motions that are replicating this bouncing of the shock wave, and then there are those plumes that start forming. If we look at the corresponding neutrino signal, then we would see large amplitude sinusoidal modulations of the neutrino signal that are reproducing this bouncing of uh, the shock wave. And for example, if we consider the power spectrum of the neutrino signal in the, uh, during the SASI episodes, 
we can uh, measure which is the frequency at which the, uh, uh, the shock wave is uh, bouncing. And this is uh, something that we can also compute analytically. So by uh, having the detection of the neutrino signal, we would really be able to test our theoretical conjectures. And this, uh, this uh, uh, frequency can be computed analytically because it, it depends from a ratio between uh, the proton-neutron star radius and the shock radius, which uh, again, we know from, from uh, simulations. So what is interesting is that the gravitational waves are carrying um, really complementary information with respect to neutrinos. Here you see the two signals on top of each other, and they both carry signatures of uh, the SASI episodes, as well as, for example, in this uh, model, there is a convective activity in between uh, two SASI episodes. Now, by looking at 3D simulations, we also uh, found uh, unexpected uh, results that are uh, again concerning neutrinos. Indeed, we expected that the neutrinos were emitted uh, homogeneously across the supernova, but uh, what instead we found is that uh, actually the neutrino emission forms uh, a dipole. And so in one hemisphere of the star, we see more electron neutrinos being emitted, and in the other hemisphere instead, we see more antineutrinos being emitted. This asymmetry can reach up to the 20 to 30% with respect to the average emission. What you see here is a plot of the uh, neutrino uh, lepton number flux across the supernova uh, sphere. So we named this uh, asymmetry LESA that stands for lepton number uh, self-sustained asymmetry. And this uh, large scale dipole can have uh, consequences on uh, the flavor conversion physics on the signal that we observe, but also in the propagation of the shock and in the synthesis of the elements. Now, another uh, um, feature is that not all supernovae are the same. And indeed, uh, more recent work is pointing uh, towards uh, the possibility that the many supernovae, up to 50% uh, of all supernovae, can actually lead to the formation of a black hole after the collapse, instead of leaving behind a neutron star. Now, those uh, collapses are called uh, usually a failed supernova. And um, it's, uh, if we have a failed supernova, then we wouldn't be able, most likely, to see it electromagnetically, because uh, as soon as uh, the black hole forms, then nothing more is emitted. And in this case, only neutrinos and probably gravitational waves could be the only probes that uh, a collapse of this sort is uh, going on. If we look at the neutrino signal, you see here the luminosity as a function of time, and you can see that the neutrino signal is abruptly interrupted at the moment of black hole formation. And this is a smoking gun signature of the formation of, the, of a black hole. So by looking at a neutrinos coming from supernova, we would be able then to detect this kind of collapses, which wouldn't be, uh, we couldn't see otherwise. In particular, uh, recently, we looked at the first uh, uh, 3D simulations of uh, black hole forming collapses. And what you see here is the event rate expected in neutrinos as a function of time. Now, what we find in all the models that uh, we have explored is that uh, uh, the neutrino signal uh, shows a very strong SASI activity, which would be visible uh, way beyond our galaxy. And also, it is very long lasting. So it means that, for example, if we take the neutrino signal here and then we decompose it in frequency, so we have a spectrogram of the signal, you can see that these red regions here are telling us which is the SASI frequency. And while in the uh, plot, in the model that we saw uh, before, there was a very, uh, there was a shorter SASI activity, here we can follow the evolution of the SASI activity. Now, the SASI frequency is depending from uh, the shock radius and the neutron star radius. So the fact that here we can follow the evolution of this frequency is actually letting us track the evolution of the shock radius. And you can see here that is expanding and then contracting and then expanding again and then contracting just before black hole formation. So by looking at the uh, decomposition in frequency of the neutrino signal, we could really look uh, at what is happening just a few instants before the black hole forms. 
Now, we know that uh, uh, neutrinos reach Earth a bit earlier than photons, and therefore we could use them as an alert for uh, astronomers to uh, detect very early on supernovae so that they can catch the shock breakout, which carries a lot of information about the structure of the supernova itself. And for this reason, there is a network of neutrino detectors that would release an alert to astronomers and gravitational wave physicists as soon as they detect a bunch of neutrinos in coincidence. This is this news network, which is currently has been rebooted and is as news 2.0 and includes many more features that take into account the multi-messenger era in which we are in. In addition, we can use uh, triangulation and uh, pointing in the case of a uh, Cherenkov detector to uh, pinpoint which is the location of a supernova in the sky by using uh, neutrinos. And this is especially useful, um, as I mentioned already before, for the case of failed supernova, because in uh, this case, neutrinos and gravitational waves would be the only uh, probes that we have of uh, this kind of transients. And also in the case of uh, supernovae that uh, um, occur in regions that are very dusty and therefore they are difficult to, to observe electromagnetically. Now, uh, if we, uh, this is like what I just told you could be learned uh, if we consider a single supernova burst. But uh, uh, we know that uh, one supernova is going off every second somewhere in the universe. So besides detecting the single supernova burst, we could also look at the diffuse background of neutrinos coming from all supernova emitted somewhere in the universe. This is what is called the diffuse supernova neutrino background, and uh, it has not been detected yet. However, here you can see uh, those are the theoretical expectations, and these are the current upper limits. Now, um, this is a guaranteed signal in the sense that it's a stationary signal and it's there. And these are extremely exciting times because uh, Super Kamiokande is being enriched with the uh, gadolinium, which uh, will allow the detection of the DSMB. And at the same time, also Juno is a liquid scintillator detector that is being built in China. Uh, and also as, a, as a one of the main goals, the detection of the, the DSMB. So within the next few years or so, um, we will surely detect uh, this flux. Now, why this is so interesting? Because when we consider neutrinos coming from a single supernova burst, as we have seen, we can characterize the, property of that specific, the properties of that specific burst. If we detect the uh, diffuse supernova neutrino background instead, we become sensitive to properties of the supernova population. For example, we could uh, uh, put a constraint on the rate of supernova only by using the neutrinos, and we would constrain the supernova rate up to a 30% precision. In addition, if we have uh, many supernova that uh, collapse into black holes, since the neutrinos in this case uh, have higher uh, average energies, then the tail of the DSMB spectrum becomes larger and larger. So by um, detecting the DSMB, we could also put a constraint on the fraction of supernova that the collapse into black holes, which at the moment is something that is very difficult to do uh, only with electromagnetic radiation. Now, one of the uh, problems which at the moment is really uh, one of the least understood concerning the physics of these sources concerns the modeling of uh, the, the, the mixing of neutrinos in the supernova envelope. And the reason is that uh, we know that the uh, neutrinos interact with the uh, matter, and this uh, gives rise to uh, the well-known MSW effects, which is a linear uh, effect. However, in environments that are extremely dense in neutrinos, such as supernovae, such as compact binary mergers, or also the early universe, we also need to consider the uh, scattering of neutrinos among each other. This is uh, uh, something that makes the evolution, the flavor evolution of neutrinos nonlinear, because we have to consider a feedback of the neutrino field onto itself. 
And moreover, uh, very recently, um, uh, we started to realize that not only is important the energy distribution with which neutrinos are emitted from a supernova, but also the angular distribution uh, matters. So it's important that the angle with which the neutrinos scatter with each other. Now, um, in the, in the past, the, all hydrodynamical, sim or actually also now, all hydrodynamical simulations are run without considering uh, the fact that the neutrinos can change their flavor. And this uh, uh, simplification was uh, justified because we talked that uh, um, the MSW effects were happening a very large radii from the core of the supernova, which here it's uh, from where neutrinos start to free, to free stream. Um, and this is uh, the shock radius. And then uh, there were interactions of uh, neutrinos among each other that were happening here. So basically all these oscillation physics were happen was happening uh, beyond the shock radius, while all the physics that uh, concerns the explosion was happening in this uh, yellow region here. So the two parts were completely separated and therefore the flavor mixing would have been important for the detection of those uh, neutrinos and uh, maybe also for uh, uh, nucleosynthesis, but uh, not for the explosion. However, more recent work is pointing uh, towards the possibility that actually uh, neutrinos uh, can start to change their flavor already in this uh, uh, region, even before they uh, decouple uh, and start to free stream. Now, this becomes a problem because if neutrinos have a larger flavor mixing in this region, then um, we cannot run any more hydrodynamical simulations neglecting uh, neutrino mixing. And this also means that uh, since, as I mentioned before, the all expression mechanism is completely driven by neutrinos, then uh, probably we would also need to revise what we think uh, of the expression mechanism also today. Now, this is uh, uh, clearly very complicated because uh, there are, uh, we need to resolve oscillations that are happening on centimeters time scales versus hundreds of kilometers, that is the scale of a supernova. And so what has been done up to now is to consider uh, a linear stability analysis method, which basically considers the, um, the, the conditions that we have in a certain point of a supernova, and only tells us whether we have favorable conditions for uh, those flavor conversions to occur or not, but it doesn't tell us which is the final flavor outcome. More recently, in my team, we developed a, a multidimensional simulation that uh, is following the neutrino field. This is in a patch of the supernova of 20 kilometers for 20 kilometers, very close to the core. And we follow it in time. And uh, so this is in space. And then we have for each point the angular distribution of neutrinos. And what we found is that the fact that the neutrinos are also streaming besides oscillating actually changes dynamically the conditions that can lead to flavor conversions. And uh, uh, this is something that has not, it cannot be predicted by the linear stability analysis. And it clearly points towards uh, the fact that we need to move forward by simulating numerically the evolution of the neutrino field. So this is the uh, first result of this kind. And of course, there is more work needed to make it uh, more realistic. And at the moment, we still don't know whether uh, flavor mixing can actually arm our current understanding of the explosion mechanism. Now, another environment that is uh, as dense in neutrinos as a supernova are compact binary mergers. I'm sure you all heard about the 2017 event from which we detected the gravitational waves as well as electromagnetic radiation at different uh, wave bands. And in this case, we uh, didn't see neutrinos because uh, the event was too far away for uh, neutrinos to be detectable. However, we can have an indirect effect of uh, neutrinos in the synthesis of the elements. Indeed, one of the most burning questions that we have still today concerns the origin of the elements that are heavier than iron, like for example, platinum or gold. And the two favorite sites have been since a while now, core collapse supernova and uh, neutron star mergers. 
However, in the case of uh, core collapse supernova, more recent simulations are pointing um, towards environments that are not very neutron rich. That is exactly what we need actually to make those heavy elements. And mergers in this case are uh, a favorite candidate because we start with something that is already neutron rich. Now, the main reactions that drive the synthesis of the elements are the ones that you see here. Now, you can see that if we change the amount of Nui and Nui bar because of flavor conversions, then this means that we can also change the amount of protons over neutrons, and therefore we can change the neutron richness of the environment. So we can produce different uh, elements according to what the neutrinos are doing and how they can change their flavor. So um, recently we uh, analyzed and we considered the possibility that the neutrinos change their flavor in uh, compact battery mergers. And we wondered whether this can affect the predictions that uh, we get from hydrodynamical simulations concerning uh, the spectrum of elements that should be uh, produced in these sources. And we found that uh, um, actually uh, the neutrino mixing can lead to an enhancement of uh, um, the production of lanthanides, so of all the elements with the atomic number larger than 130, uh, of more than a factor of uh, 1,000, which means that uh, these would also have implications on um, the kilonova observations, where uh, the kilonova is the transient that uh, comes from the radioactive decay of uh, the, uh, the heavy elements that are uh, synthesized in the mergers. So um, th those are uh, preliminary results, and uh, we need uh, to do more work to uh, robustly assess which is the role of neutrino mixing in the production of the elements, and therefore also in uh, the, the consequent electromagnetic uh, radiation that is uh, observed. <clears throat> Now, um, if we move to higher energies instead, um, we move to the non-thermal universe. And uh, in this case, we know that uh, the 20% of our universe is actually opaque to electromagnetic radiation. And uh, neutrinos uh, are basically uh, the ones that can carry again information about uh, this universe. So in this case, we, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we observe uh, neutrinos that have uh, high energy and uh, they are clearly coming from uh, cosmic accelerators that are powering the non-thermal universe. And at the moment, um, we measure a flux. We don't know uh, whether what we see is actually a single power law or it's broken in multiple components. And this could give suggestions about uh, the nature of the sources of those uh, neutrinos. And what we see is that the neutrino events that we detect are almost homogeneously distributed in the sky, which suggests that the the neutrinos are coming from beyond our galaxy. Up to now, there has been no association of uh, neutrinos with uh, specific source classes, except for an association of uh, neutrinos uh, with uh, a blazer source, which however uh, has uh, some problems in, in the, in, in, uh, if we try to interpret within a unifying uh, scenario the neutrinos and the electromagnetic radiation that has been observed from these blazers altogether. And there is also uh, a possible connection between uh, a burst of neutrinos that has been observed with the tidal disruption events, which is also um, similarly uh, problematic. Now, um, one of the uh, uh, main goals at the moment is understanding what are the sources from which uh, those neutrinos are coming from. And uh, this also would help in identifying a connection between neutrinos, gravitational waves, cosmic rays, and eventually gravitational waves. And the detection or understanding what are the sources would also um, really help in pinpointing and in testing uh, our current uh, theories on the production of, of uh, high energy particles and particle acceleration in the sources. But at the same way, we can, at the same time, we are also in the position of using these neutrinos to learn about the physics of the sources. And of course, we can also test them, uh, we can also use them to test in a standard physics. Now, for what concerns the sources from which uh, these neutrinos are coming from, 
um, various source classes have been explored. And uh, what you see here is uh, um, a plane where we have uh, the uh, typical density of sources as and uh, on the x axis that is the luminosity. And what you see in blue is the region that can be excluded with the 10 years of ice cube. And the green region is the region that is excluded with the 10 years of ice cube generation too. And on the left, you see it for steady sources and on the right, is those are transient sources. So what is interesting, is that of all sources candidates, as you can see, basically we will be able to test or to exclude or to uh, um, consider them as uh, um, real sources from which neutrinos are coming from within uh, next generation experiments. At the same time, we are already in the position of using the neutrinos that we observe, although we don't know uh, what are their sources exactly, to learn about the properties of the sources. For example, uh, we can consider um, how many uh, supernovae can then harbor jets that then can lead to the emission of high energy neutrinos, or which is the uh, redshift evolution of the sources that uh, are emitting the neutrinos that we observe. Or here you see an example of high energy neutrinos constraints and the magnetic fields of uh, the sources that uh, we are observing. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we can also study you know, standard physics. And this is uh, uh, true really across all energy ranges of uh, neutrinos of astrophysical origin that we see here. And indeed, here you see a summary with all possible scenarios that uh, could be explored. At the moment, we basically are exploring all this region here. And the, the hope in the future is then to push also um, our frontier towards uh, ultra high energies. Now, one of the problems that is becoming uh, uh, more and more evident, however, when we study no standard uh, physics scenarios so, uh, by using astrophysical sources, is that we need a self-consistent modeling of uh, the neutrino uh, production and propagation in the sources. Well, uh, one example is reported here, where, for example, we tried to constrain um, uh, key V masses, the red neutrinos, which are currently considered as a dark matter candidates, uh, in the context of uh, core collapse supernovae. And uh, um, the, the exclusion bounds, this is uh, the mass and the mixing of these particles, and these uh, dashed lines are the uh, exclusion bounds that are currently uh, quoted in the literature as the exclusion regions for those particles coming from uh, supernova. Uh, however, uh, those kind of models considered only one zone models where the fact that the neutrinos can change their flavor uh, has no impact on the dynamics of the supernova itself. If we take this into account and we consider a multi-zone model where as the neutrinos are produced that then they have a feedback on the star and vice versa, then actually what we find is that the excluded region really shrinks a lot and probably this will even disappear if the estimation is done even more consistently than we did. So this drastic change is suggesting that we really need to be careful as we start uh, using astrophysical neutrinos as a probes for a standard physics in modeling the physics uh, consistently. Now, uh, another uh, direction that is uh, very interesting is that, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, up to now, the main technologies adopted for uh, the detection of neutrinos of astrophysical origin are uh, liquid Cherenkov and uh, sorry, Cherenkov detector and scintillators, but uh, there are also new technologies uh, being explored. One of these is uh, the uh, coherent scattering of neutrinos on nuclei. Um, we know that uh, uh, this is, uh, for example, being used for direct detection of dark matter experiments. And a few years ago, we proposed the possibility of using those uh, detectors, in particular, we focused on uh, Darwin, as a, a telescope so to detect uh, supernova neutrinos, but then also um, solar neutrinos. And uh, the reason being that uh, the coherent scattering is uh, uh, flavor blind. And in this sense, uh, these kind of detectors would offer a possibility uh, of being com complementary to dedicated uh, searches of neutrinos. And this is the reason why they were 
proposed initially by Dukier and Sodolsky. And also those kind of detectors uh, allow also a very reasonable signal over noise uh, background. And uh, currently uh, also DarkSide and Dargo are uh, employing this, uh, uh, are extending basically their uh, goals to also uh, become new chain observatories. Uh, more recently, we proposed the ResNova uh, detector, which again would be based on uh, coherent scattering of neutrinos or nuclei, but um, it would have as a target lead. Um, and the reason is that the lead has the highest cross section among all these elements. And so this would allow uh, an, a larger uh, statistics and would allow to um, uh, realize a detector that is extremely compact uh, in size. And uh, uh, this would be really an alternative towards uh, uh, next generation detectors that instead are becoming, of course, uh, bigger uh, and bigger. And uh, we need, uh, of course, all of them to, to, to do neutrino astrophysics. Uh, when we move on instead of to higher energies, um, there are many uh, radio telescopes that are uh, coming up online. And uh, they, some of them are follow up on uh, pilot arrays like ARA and Ariana. And uh, the idea is that in this way, we can continue to explore the flux beyond the PV energy and finally discover ultra energy neutrinos. So this brings me to my uh, conclusions. Uh, we have seen as a new, today we have a new ways of looking uh, at the universe and in particular neutrinos are uh, revealing to be key particles in the physics of compact sources and we know that already at the moment they have the potential of carrying really crucial information about the physics of these course, sources. The uh, modeling of the sources as well as of the uh, physics of neutrinos in the sources has just begun and is uh, leading to very fascinating and counterintuitive uh, effects. At the same time, neutrinos are also a gateway to uh, standard physics and they can be used as a laboratory uh, for uh, particle physics. And we have a growing number of neutrino detectors that are ready for new discoveries. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice, uh, oops, my, my camera was off. <laughs> Thank you very much, Irene, for the very nice talk. Um, are there any questions? Uh, if you have, just raise your hand through the reaction button on the bottom of Zoom. There were a lot of two <laughs> information. Yeah. No question. Go Jeter, thanks. Thank you very much for the talk. I, I enjoyed that. Um, I guess there's a, a couple of things. You know, we have a, a lead detector at Snow Lab. And so I was interested in, in maybe getting some of your thoughts on connecting some of this modeling with the, you know, the sensitivity of the lead detectors to, uh, you know, for example, normal electron neutrinos instead of the anti-electron neutrinos that these others are so sensitive to. Um, if that helps yeah. you pull the thread I think on some you are of these talking things. about uh, ALO, no? Correct. So, yeah, so um, uh, in, the, in this paper here, uh, whoop, sorry, I wanted to show you where I have the ResNova thing. Well, anyway, yeah. So in the paper, in this paper here on uh, ResNova, we actually make the comparison with the ALO. Uh, and the, 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 the main thing is that if you use, if you can rely on coherent scattering, then the statistics becomes quite large. Um, and so, of course, uh, this allows you, for example, to learn about uh, or to do some physics, for example, in the context of uh, supernova or also solar neutrinos and atmospheric neutrinos. Um, if the detector instead is small and, for example, you just don't use you, you just uh, uh, have a smaller statistics, then you can maybe like detect the, 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 for example, there is a supernova burst, 
But then it becomes a bit more difficult to extract information on the physics of the source, for example, because in order to do this, you, you really need the high statistics. Does this address your question? Well, a little bit. I, I was just trying to, maybe I could, I could pose it differently. Does the, um, does the flavor, the, the relative insensitivity of coherent scattering to, to most of the features of the neutrino, um, does that allow you to compare to some of these other detectors? So combining detectors. Um, oh, yes, yes, definitely. So I didn't understand. Yeah, and, so... and to understand the physics that way, yes. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the, one of the things that the, it's at the moment very, very uncertain concern, concerns the oscillation physics. And this can, uh, of course, our ignorance then becomes a limiting factor because a signal that we can see maybe can be degenerated, could be due to oscillation physics, could be due to no standard physics or to other factors. So by having uh, those uh, coherent detectors, this really allows complementarity because then we can detect, uh, we can use different detectors. Hopefully each of them is giving us uh, different information about uh, each, about a different flavor. And then we combine it with something that is instead the completely flavor insensitive and this really helps to break the degeneracies. So besides being having those detectors as you know being great detectors in the sense of being uh, compact but also guaranteeing a statistics is very nice that they offer complementary information. So at the moment, they are very useful, especially because we don't, uh, especially for the uncertainties that we have on the oscillation physics. Thank you. Nigel. Okay, uh, thanks for a great talk, Irene. Um, I was intrigued by the statement that the, um, the neutrino oscillations, the flavor oscillations could increase the lanthanide production by three orders of magnitude. Are there any um, constraints applied to that statement from direct observations of stellar composition, interstellar media, and so on? Yeah, so um, at the moment, basically, this is uh, still compatible with the observation of the, 1980, uh, of the 2017 event. And the reason is that uh, uh, I didn't go into the details, but the neutrino wind would, uh, and so this effect here, would be mainly efficient in the region surrounding the jet of, uh, of, uh, of a merger. So it's uh, only like the polar region that is interesting, interested or invested by the neutrino wind. So this means that uh, for the 2017 event, we observed it at 30 degrees with respect to its axis. And this uh, uh, meant that the, the neutrino wind is starting to basically become more inefficient. So mostly what we see is the production from the equatorial region of elements. And so this, uh, uh, this is uh, completely compatible with observations. But if we happen to see a kilonova on axis, then this means that instead of seeing a red component, we would see a blue component. So there we would have a very strong constraint that there is something that is, uh, uh, that is maybe due to neutrinos or, or we are not really understanding what is going on. And actually uh, this was found for uh, a model where we had a black hole in the center. And then more recently we have considered the, uh, a model with an hypermassive neutron star at the center. And we see uh, a less strong effect simply because the, uh, the neutrino wind seems to be less efficient in affecting the element production. So we are, these are like the first studies of this kind and we're really trying to understand a bit better what is going on. But for the moment, is everything compatible with observations? Thank you. Next question, Nink. So apologies if I mispronounce your name, go uh. ahead. That's very good. And um, thank you for this great talk. Uh, I also have some question about uh, the uh, kilonova and uh, how like neutrinos could oscillate there. So um, I think from your previous answer to the questions, it seemed that uh, um, we the the heavy elements abundance is still a uh, is still consistent with what we observed, like the abundances of these heavy elements in the sun. So um, because the 
we don't know much about the detail of the merger, like the neutron star merger. I'm wondering how you like model the neutrino oscillation in the in the neutron star merger. And how yeah, so yeah, so there are two sides to this question. One side is how we actually simulate the mergers itself. And this, uh, at the moment, is, uh, uh, we, there is still a lot of work to do because uh, there are simulations that uh, some of them are including uh, MHD effects, while some others are including neutrino transport. But uh, we don't have a complete self consistent simulation. So, uh, from this perspective, things uh, can still change. These kind of predictions, as all existing predictions on the elements that we are expected to be emitted from mergers, are just based on these kind of simulations, and they don't consider uh, flavor conversions. So what we, we did here was to consider one of these simulations, and then on top of it, assume that we had an extreme condition in which there was a full flavor mixing. And we predicted that this, uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, variation in the uh, abundance of elements. Now, more recently, a few months ago, uh, in my team, we actually tried uh, to build a model where, for the first time, we simulated how the flavor is evolving above the accretion disk. So this is a multidimensional model. Uh, similar to this uh, 2D model that I, I showed you here, but it, this is, it was done for mergers. And we studied how neutrinos were propagating above the emission region and how they were changing their flavor. And so this is, uh, uh, this is uh, done separately from the hydrodynamics, but it gives you an idea of how much the flavor is changing. And we needed to, impl uh, to implement further elements that we are still missing before to uh, have you know, a complete picture of how much flavor conversions we can have uh, in the mergers. But uh, uh, yes, in this case, we assumed that, that uh, there was a full flavor mixing, which is uh, something that uh, uh, somehow was expected because if we assume that we have uh, flavor conversions that are happening on centimeters at time scale, then very e easily you will go to something that is like similar to the coherence. So it was actually justified on the basis of theories. But uh, uh, the simulations are not easy. So uh, it's, very, it's very challenging to reach a, a level of sophistication that allows basically to include all those elements. It's very expensive also computationally. Yeah, so um, I know normally we will need to run the nuclear reaction network in order to get the, in order to get or predict the final abundance of these heavy elements. So I'm wondering how you can do this. Um, yeah, so this is done in this case. So we do it. So so in this case, basically, uh, like uh, for. for so for the case where we just evolved, that I mentioned for the simulations, where we just evolved the neutrino field, that is not taking into account any impact on the element productions yet. But in this case, we basically make a, a, a parametric modeling of how the neutrino field is evolving. And then this, in turn, is affecting the electron abundance. And then we put everything into uh, a nuclear network and we uh, let it run. And we, this is uh, the outcome. So this is all done consistently. It's just that uh, the usual predictions that you see are not considering the oscillations of neutrinos. And in this case, we added them in a parameterized form. Yeah, thanks. Are there any other? question or comment? If not, I would like to thank Sirene again. Thank you very much for, Thanks to you. for joining for the very nice talk. And talk to you next time. <laughs> I stop yeah. the recording if I can. Thanks a lot. <laughs>